Good evening, and welcome to the Redeemer's Place. We're glad to see you here this evening. We're going to start with some scripture from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in Mirabah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your creative hand. You made the heavens and the earth. You made the seas, the mountains, and all that is in it. And although you are so powerful and so mighty, you love us so much. We thank you for that love. We thank you, Lord, for gathering us here tonight to worship you and to praise your holy name. We thank you, Lord, for loving us. We thank you for this small body of believers that you've sprung up in this church at the Redeemer's Place. And we pray for your continued blessing that you would help us to go forth and glorify your name in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If everyone would stand and join us for worship.
Let's go see everybody. Lord of the earth, shout your name, shout your name. Filling out the skies with endless praise, endless praise. We love to show your name, oh Lord. Oh, 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 oh. We love you, Father.
That was beautiful. Thank you, team. That was wonderful. And now we are at the point in our worship service where we continue our worship of God by giving our tithes and offerings. He is worthy, and he has given us everything, and it's such a blessing to be able to give back to him and help him expand the kingdom. So if you're here tonight for the first time, welcome. Um, but we want you to know that this part of the service is only for those who regularly attend the Redeemer's Place. And we ask that if you're here for the first time, that you would honor God by giving at your home church. But for those of you from the Redeemer's Place, uh, if you would like to give tonight, you can do it in three ways. We have, um, you can write a check or put cash in one of the offering envelopes and leave that in the buckets as they are passed. And if you want a tax deduction, you can just fill in your information there. Um, secondly, you can grab your cell phone and your credit card and go to theredeemersplace.com. Click on the Give button and you'll find directions there. Or third, you can go to the texting feature on your phone. In the two area, you would enter 77977. In the message area, you would enter Redeemers Place, all caps, no punctuation, and then follow the directions there, and you would need a credit card to finish that transaction as well. And after you've done all that, you're probably exhausted, <laughs> so you can uh, just, we'll continue with our worship, and the worship team will guide us some more. Sorry, can I do a retake? I'll get in trouble if I forget this part. <laughs> the most important part. Let's pray over the offering that God will bless it. Thank you, Father, for blessing us so that we can turn around and give you back a portion of what you've given to us. We thank you, Lord, for this church, the Redeemer's Place, and, and just what you're doing in our midst. We pray that you would continue this work. Thank you, Lord, for those who have given, for the givers, and we pray that you would bless us all. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, you're the one who never leaves the one behind. Reckless love. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me You have been so, so kind to me See you. 
so you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't lie high, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't lie high. Amen. Aren't we blessed? Amen. Thank you, team. Give them a little clapping offering. Thank you. Guys. Amen. Well, good evening. You guys can be seated. Welcome to the Redeemer's Place. Listen, thanks so much for being here this week for our last sermon in our series on being a biblically-centric church member. You know, I am so thankful for your willingness to stick with us since January 2nd when we kicked off this series with the theme of Be the Church, the call for us to be an incarnational church, a church that is salt and light in our community, a church that lives biblical truth before our community as a witness to Jesus, a church that intentionally engages our community for Jesus. And you remember from there we talked about the need to be a praying people, a unified and unifying people, an evangelical people, a serving people, a giving people, and a gathering people. Now listen, I realize that this has been a very heavy discipleship-oriented series so I want to say thanks for sticking with us through this season. This has been meat and potatoes, no fluff, nothing flashy or splashy. And if you want to know the truth, that's not what I'm about. You've probably noticed that. That's not what our church is about. I just want to be honest with you, just saying, as they say. And tonight, we're going to end this series with what I think is the most important sermon for our church over the last year. We're going to talk about church leadership. Specifically, what the Bible has to say about your role as church members and what is the role of the pastor, elder, overseer, or bishop in the local church. Tonight, the stage is set for the next step of growth for us as a church. But before we do that, let me welcome all of you who are new with us, whether you're here in person or you're online with us. My name is Joe Gwines, and I'm the pastor of the Redeemer's Place and I want to extend the warmest greeting possible to you on behalf of our church family. And I hope that because you've been here tonight, you're renewed and you're refreshed. It will be our blessing if that's the case. In fact, I hope that you can call the Redeemer's Place your home church after tonight. And let me remind you of why we exist. Gang, you're going to hear this every week until Jesus comes again. We exist to joyfully and to passionately glorify God 
as we proclaim the supremacy of Jesus and we edify you. You see, we simply want to be your church, your friends, your family. Incidentally, this proclamation of why we exist applies to us collectively as a church as well as individuals as we go about our daily lives. Why do I say that? Why can I say that? Well, it's because the Redeemer's place, it is not a building. It is us as a people who have been called by God to gather together to represent Him in, here in this community. Being joyful and being passionate about glorifying God and telling others about Jesus as we help each other in life, it is so critical during this crazy time of our lives. I hope that you can catch a glimpse of the transcendence of that vision, that it works under all circumstances and times. It doesn't rope us into programs or methods. It gives us adaptability to start new things and to kill old things that no longer fulfill our vision. It can be applied to our individual lives as we go about our, our daily walk to make disciples of Jesus. And as we head into the postmodern Christian era, Adaptability will be key as long as we stay focused on the ultimate purpose of glorifying God, proclaiming the supremacy of Jesus, and edifying you. So that's what we're all about here at the Redeemer's Place. So let's begin tonight, as we always do, by standing together to honor God as we pray for seeking His blessings and glory in His time and His Word tonight. So stand if you're able, and let's pray. Father, we approach you tonight, and we're thankful for your chance to come and study your word. Father, we're thankful that we're your church, that we're your friend, that we're your family. We're thankful that you have made us one. We come from so many different walks of life, cultures and ethnicities, socioeconomic differences, and Lord, you have made us one in Jesus. We are so thankful for that. We pray that tonight that you would be glorified in everything that we say and do in this service. And we pray this in Christ's name. And all his people said, Amen. So remain standing and listen to the two texts that are foundational to our subject tonight. The first is found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And the second is going to be found in Hebrews 13. So let me begin with 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 7. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil." Amen. Now listen to Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word tonight. You may be seated. So tonight, we begin to talk about church leadership. It's a big subject, and here's what we will see as we study tonight. Elders and members both have leadership roles in the church. Let me say that again. Elders and members both have leadership roles in the church. So the question is, what is the difference in leadership responsibilities between elders and members, and how are they exhibited to the glory of God in the local church? To begin to answer that, I want to start with something that may seem to be mundane. In the New Testament, the term we translate as church is the Greek word ekklesia. It's used by Jesus twice and by the Apostle Paul over 40 times. 
And it's always, it's always used to reveal a unified gathering of Christians for one specific purpose and only one purpose, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world and to support, encourage, and protect the local Christian community. The ecclesia, that's you and me, that's both of us together. It's not the myriad of parish church organizations that we see today. It's the only ordained institution by God for this specific purpose. And throughout the New Testament, we never see the word member or membership to describe the congregation of the local church. Instead, we see terms like body or armor or family or brother or sister. You see, the love bond in the local church is not like a gym membership. We are a family that is intent on loving, serving, protecting, and caring for each other as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are like an embassy that represents the intent of Christ to the world and provides assistance and protection to his citizens. You know, in the book of Acts, we see the people being added to the Jerusalem church by the thousands. And shortly thereafter, we see individual groups of Christians coming together in places like Antioch and Iconium, Corinth, Rome, Ephesus, Colossae, and Philippi, and Galatia to form local churches to represent Christ and to provide assistance to Christians in these locations. And if you recall our study of Revelations, we saw additional churches in the first four chapters of Revelations. These bodies of believers in Jesus... They were united in their life together. And you remember the picture painted by the early church in, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, when Luke said this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together together. And had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Amen. What a beautiful picture of the church. You know, those, those words also describe our church to a large extent. You know, we do life together. We care for each other. As an example, I want to thank you guys for your warm words and your encouragement and your prayers as Kathy and I dealt with a family situation this last couple of days. Your prayers have been felt and they've been blessed. Thank you so much for that. We are a biblically-centric church that takes our Christian faith serious. It's what we are. Praise God. Amen? And there is something unique about our collective being together. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, that when the Corinthian church was gathered together, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ is present, Echoing Jesus' words that wherever two or three are gathered together in his name, he is present as well. So you see, when we come together, Jesus is here with us, empowering us to do his work in our world. This is one of the reasons why we must gather together. It's one of the reasons why I bug you about that all the time, and I will keep bugging you about it all the time. Therefore, the idea of a lone Christian not connected to a local congregation was a non-starter for the early church. And so it is with us. Membership in a local body of believers is the expectation of all Christians. Let me say that again. Membership in a local body of believers is the expectation for all Christians. We cannot do life alone, especially today. Therefore, if you're not connected to a local body of Christians, come, come and join us. And the first step in that journey is going to be baptism, just like in the early church. So if you want to join the Redeemer's Place, you will need to be baptized if you've never ever done that before. That is your first step. So see me afterwards if you want to arrange a time for your baptism. We have several people that are signed up. 
and I would love to dunk you. It would be my pleasure. And candidly, I never want the baptismal waters to be still here at the Redeemer's place. But now, let's get into the nitty-gritty about what are your specific leadership roles as members in the Redeemer's place. It is a great question, and it includes the following. First, we are to live in accordance to the teachings of Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament in the Scriptures. We are to separate ourselves from our old way of life. For example, Paul tells the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, to come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. We are also to love and support each other and share the same with those that we come into contact with. We are to be a family that is always seeking to expand our family members as we share Jesus with our community. We are to be outward focused, not inward focused. This is not a club. We have a mission to fulfill. So our holy huddle must always be seeking to expand its membership as we share Jesus in our community. We are not a closed society. Amen? Amen. Next, as we read in our opening text tonight, we are to submit ourselves to the leadership of the local church. Notice that the writer to the Hebrews says not to make our submission a difficult task, for it's not beneficial on our part. Why would he say that? What in the world is he getting at? Well, I think it's simple. I speak from experience. Making life difficult in the church diverts the leadership's attention from what he should be doing, which is helping you grow in the Lord. And remember, the leadership of the local church will be held accountable for their leadership of the local church. I am going to be held accountable for you and your life. That is sobering to me. That is so deep to me. That is so big to me. That is why I'm constantly calling you and texting you and writing you. Membership in the local church, it is grounded in submission, not in the rights like we have at a local gym membership. It is intended to model our submission to Jesus. Next, we are to protect the fellowship from false professors of our common faith. It's not just the pastor or the elder's role. As a member of this family, you have that responsibility as well. Let me give you a real-life example of what I'm talking about. You know, when my two sons were in high school, they would come home and they would tell me which people my two daughters were not allowed to date. It was wonderful getting the inside scoop for me. I'm not sure my daughters loved it. You know, they were, my sons were all about protecting their sisters it's the same exact model seen time and time again in the New Testament. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5.13, Paul tells the assembly to expel the wicked person from among you. And in Titus 3.10, he tells the church in Crete to warn a divisive person twice and then have nothing to do with them. The lesson is that the testimony of the local body to the reality of Christ in their lives it was just too important to be sacrificed for its witness in the community. Incidentally, this role expands to keeping pastors in line. That's one of your responsibilities. You have every right and you have my permission to confront me if I teach false doctrine or if I live a life that does not express the reality of Jesus in my life. You know, if congregations were more adept at this leadership role, we would see a lot less pastors falling, bringing great harm to the church in the name of Christ. Next, as, as we, are, we are to resolve conflict in the church biblically, if and when it arises, to protect the unity of our body. In Matthew 18, verses 15 through 20, Jesus lays out a very, very specific process for conflict resolution that centers on issue clarification with loving confrontation and the protection of the church and the parties involved. Individuals are to talk first, seeking clarification to avoid misunderstanding. And if resolution cannot be reached after the clarity of the issue is known, two or more eyewitnesses are to be brought in to assist in the resolution. And if that doesn't work, 
The issue is brought before the church at large. You should know that we have actively practiced this model here at the Redeemer's Place. It's never gotten to your attention because the resolution has been achieved. Praise God. Finally, we here at the Redeemer's Place have also prepared three short videos that explain our membership process in depth. They cover our membership requirements, doctrines, and statement of faith in our roles as member leaders in the local church. The three videos are in total less than an hour long, so they're very short. And these videos can be found on our website at theredeemersplace.com under the sermon series section entitled Membership Series to help you understand the full scope of your responsibilities as a member. And we're going to require you to watch these videos and read what they talk about and sign a membership covenant and return that to us by March 13th. So that's two weeks from now. I think you're going to need a link and a password to access these videos. So I'll be mailing that out tonight after the service. And if you're online or you're not part of our communication vehicles, please email me at info at the and I will get you the link and the password. On your way in tonight, you should have received the, the membership co covenant. And I will send you the link to print that down if you want. A copy is also available on our website for the download. You can leave your signed membership covenant with the ladies in the lobby, or you can sign it and scan it and send it to me at info at theredeemersplace.com. So let's remember, as members, our role as leaders is to live in accordance with the teachings of Jesus Christ and His Word, to reach our world with the love of Jesus, to submit to the leadership of the local church, to help protect the flock from false professors of our faith, to resolve conflict biblically guarding the unity of our church. And we're requiring signature on the membership covenant and returning it to us by March 13th. But now, I want to turn to the role of what the New Testament calls pastor or elder or overseer or bishop. You'll see those four terms used throughout the New Testament interchangeably, but they basically mean the same thing. They are men who have responsibility for the oversight and the direction of the church. Elders are men who provide the spiritual oversight and care of the local church. These men are primarily shepherds and teachers in the church whose primary function is to help equip the saints for the work of ministry. They are equippers of the flock to share the love and the message of Jesus Christ to our world. Does that mean... Does that mean that women do not have a leadership role in the local church? Absolutely not. For example, women open our service. They run our finances. They run our first impressions team, our children's ministry, our translation ministry, and our women's ministry. And we could not do our worship services as effectively as we do without Chelsea and Minerva, Terry, Kathy, or Lisa, or Jeanette. And does that mean that women do not have a leadership role, have input into the leadership of the local church? Absolutely not. On the issues that will come before the church body for determination, women will have unfettered capability to vote. The issue on male leadership as pastors or elders or overseers or bishop, it stems from two things. First, it goes all the way back to the order God established in the Garden of Eden for leadership. Adam was to be the leader of his family, but he failed at that task when Eve took of the fruit. This is why God chastised both Adam and Eve after their fall. But Adam's failure did not change the order God intended. And second, nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament do we see women placed in overall leadership of Israel or the church. For example... Paul never chose a woman elder when he was selecting leadership of the local church. Jesus did not choose a woman as an apostle. We see the same practice in the Old Testament when kings are chosen and the prophets are selected. And if you're reading a recent translation of the NIV Bible, you'll notice that the gender terms have been changed by the editors in an, in an effort to accommodate women elders. But the Greek and the Hebrew are unequivocal. Leadership of the local church is to be male. 
Therefore, here at the Redeemer's Place, we're going to follow this model of male leadership for the ultimate leadership of the church under the headship of Christ. So this is an issue of role as defined by God's Word. It is not the value of women. Let me be very, very clear about that. This is an issue of following God's order, not the capability of women. Let me be very, very clear about that as well. We simply could not do ministry without the leadership of the women of our church. We are deeply thankful for their sacrifice and their service, just as Jesus was thankful for the women who helped him. And incidentally, this is the only place this limit limitation applies. This has no bearing on women in business or government. Women can and do fulfill very significant roles in these areas. And praise God for that fact. In fact, in our own congregation, we have amazing women who are accomplished business leaders in their own right. Praise God for these ladies who model Jesus in their worlds. So what exactly are the leadership expectations for the pastor or the elder of the local church? Well, first, in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, and 1 Peter 5, these men are to be men of good, godly character who are capable of handling God's Word correctly. You'll notice from the text that we read tonight that character reigns supreme. They are to be men who model Jesus to a high degree in their life. They are not perfect men, but men who are willing to continually submit themselves to Christ and to grow deeper and deeper with Him. They must be able to handle God's Word well and teach it. That does not necessarily mean preaching, by the way, but they must be able to teach it in the normal course of their lives. They've got to live it, in other words. They must be able to lead their families well. They must have a good reputation inside and outside the church. They cannot be driven by money. They've got to be hospitable. They've got to be gentle. They cannot be violent. The tenor of their lives, in other words, must be Christ-like. They must be an established believer demonstrating wisdom and experience, things a new believer lacks. They must smell like the sheep. They must be willing to engage in relationships with church members. They are to lovingly and gently shepherd the flock, implying that they must be willing to serve their people. Listen to Peter's words in 1 Peter 5, verses 1-4. through 4. He says this, so I exhort the elders among you as, fe as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, none to, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading, unfading crown of glory. Amen. And they are also to work towards maturing the body of Christ, as Paul proclaims in Colossians 1.28. Listen to what he says. Him we proclaim, meaning Jesus, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And, the, and in the text that we read tonight, tells us that they are overseers of the flock, meaning that they are to guard and protect the flock from false teaching. Throughout the New Testament, we see that warning time and time again. And if you've been following us on our Bible studies on Wednesday nights through First and Second Peter, Jude, and First John, you'll recognize that theme. And you'll recall what happens to all but two of the churches in Revelation, implying that their elders were not shepherding well. You know, Ezekiel chapter 33 and 34 gives a stern warning to shepherds who do not take their role seriously. I take it very seriously. And I am pleased to announce tonight that I've asked Chuck Bowie, Doug Wilson, Eno Menendez, and Alberto Malavi to join me as elders of the church. I have known most of these men for many years. I have served with them, and I have watched them closely as they've walked with Jesus. They have served faithfully. They smell like the sheep. They love you and Jesus, and they seek to live for him as best as they are able. 
I believe that they fulfill 1 Timothy 3 requirements. And I'm excited for them to be considered for this role. And they've been willing to put themselves through an intense questionnaire that challenges them on every aspect of their life. Their wives support them in this role. They are not perfect men. They would tell you that themselves, but they are seeking to grow in Christ more and more every day. And I love them dearly, and I desperately need their help. But as church members, you will be asked to vote on them to be appointed as elders in the near future once you complete that membership covenant. They are your elders after all, so I hope you can support them in this new role. So church, as we end tonight, let's remember that we are called to be leaders in the Redeemer's place. For some, it will be the role of membership as leaders. For others, it will be as the role of elder leaders. And remember that we are called to be a gathering of Christians who seek to share Jesus with our community and provide love, support, protection, encouragement to, to one another. We are to be his embassy in this community. We are an organic institution ordained by God that is intentionally outwardly focused to bring into our body new believers in Christ. We are not a closed society. We are not just a holy huddle. And remember, if you've never been baptized, that is the first step to being a member of the Redeemer's Place. And the second step is to watch the membership videos and, and sign and return the membership covenant by March 13th. And I want you to remember that next week, we're going to be celebrating our one-year anniversary. Can you believe that? It's gone by fast. So I hope, I hope and pray you and everybody else watching will be here next week. Bring your friends and family. It's going to be a wonderful night. We've got a little gift for you. We're going to have some wonderful food, some great music, and I promise a short sermon. Amen? Amen. And... Uh, Next week, we're going to begin a series on the book of Isaiah, on the four servant songs found in Isaiah as we head towards Good Friday and Easter. On Good Friday, I'm going to be preaching on Psalm 22, if you want to read ahead. And on Easter, we'll be looking at 1 Corinthians 15. So church, these are exciting days as we take our next step of growth. And I hope and pray that you're as excited as I am to see what the Lord is going to do as we joyfully and we passionately glorify God by proclaiming the supremacy of Jesus Christ and as we edify each other. May you and your family be blessed this week. And may you know your Savior in a deeper, more intimate way this week as you walk with Him every day. So let me ask you, let's pray and then let's stand as we close our service with one last song as the disciples did when they left for the Garden of Gethsemane after the Passover meal. So let's stand and pray. Father, we approach you tonight. This has been a, an intense series, a deep series. I'm thankful for everyone who has been and walked with us through this time. Father, I pray that tonight as we talk about leadership in the church, we realize that leadership involves all of us. Every one of us have a role to play in leadership in the local church. I pray your blessings upon this body, that you would continue to work in this body to share your gospel to our community, and that we would be a shining example, a city on a hill for this community to hear about the love of Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. And all his people said, amen. amen. So let's join our worship team as we close our service with song.